Messina. And he will present an invited talk, please. Well, we have to wire you. Yes, Just put it on. Like this? Yes. OK. That's it. OK. Let's put it down better. Yes. So how do I run the presentation? OK. So good morning, everybody. First of all, let me thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me today. I'm very happy to be here, not only for the conference that I am enjoying a lot, but also for the city, because Lyon is a city that I particularly like. I've been here several times, and I especially like the food. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about SiO2, and in particular, the optical spectroscopy and the processes responsible for photon-induced generation of point defects in SiO2. So I work at University of Palermo, sorry. Uh, my group, which is named the Laboratory of Advanced Materials Physics, has been involved for many years in the study of SiO2, point effects in SiO2, and especially the optical response of the material. So today, after an introduction on SiO2 and, uh, and aimed also at giving some scientific background on the questions that we will be asking ourselves later. After the introduction, I will uh, use some specific stories, three of them, uh, to illustrate some of the results we have been getting throughout the years about this material. So, to begin, SiO2 is a well-known uh, material that everybody knows. It's encountered not only in laboratories, but also in real life. For instance, everybody knows that SiO2 is one of the main components of sand, quartz stones, and so on. And despite it's been studied for a very long time, it's not uh, to be looked at as an old material in terms of technological applications, because it's still a material of choice for many important applications. For instance, you need to use a SiO2 typically if you want to fabricate optical components where a high UV transparency is required. So a SiO2 combines low cost, wide availability, mechanical and chemical stability with the very high UV transparency because it's a very wide band gap material. And also it's high insulating power, it's used in electronic components not to mention optical fibers, which are usually made of SiO2 and are the basis of modern telecommunication technologies. So it's still an important material, which raises many questions about its basic properties and damage mechanism when it's exposed to light, especially. And in very recent times, people have been shifting a little bit from bulk SiO2 to studying nanometrically confined forms of SiO2 because these are endowed with uh, some properties that are not shared by bulk SiO2, of some of which I will mention later in the talk. So from a basic point of view, <clears throat> one of the main reasons why SiO2 is interesting is that SiO2 in the amorphous form, which is called silica, is usually considered as a good model system to study the physics of amorphous solids. In fact, as everybody knows, the traditional solid state physics normally is founded on the assumption of a crystalline solid, which is a solid where you have a regular repetition of atoms in three-dimensional space. But the world is more complicated than this, so you have solids where you have a statistical distribution of connection angles between the unit cells, for instance. In the case of silica, each silicon atom forms four bonds with oxygen atoms in a tetrahedral structure, but then the connections between adjacent tetrahedra, which are regulated by this angle beta, give rise to disorder, because in silica, the amorphous form of silicon dioxide beta is distributed from side to side. So you have a loss of medium and long range order, more or less like in this illustration. 
So comparing the crystalline form of silicon dioxide, which is quartz, with the amorphous form, which is silica, has the potential to uh, reveal what consequence this order has on several physical properties. And this is one of the main reasons why people have been studying the system uh, in the course of years. So understanding the physics of disordered solids. Now, since we are going to talk a lot about uh, electronic and optical properties, I'll give you a brief introduction about uh, uh, some uh, of the main topics that we'll, we'll be discussing later. So, of course, if we discuss about the fundamental electronic properties of the material, if a material is uh, uh, perfect, meaning that you have no defects in the material, then the response of the material to light is controlled by the fundamental transition between valence and conduction band, which is called the fundamental absorption of the material, of course. Now, uh, one of the fundamental questions that me, we may ask ourselves in this uh, context is what are the consequences of disorder on the fundamental absorption of the material? So what difference exists if there is any difference between the fundamental absorption properties of quartz and silica? Okay? Now, it's not so easy to study in a direct way the fundamental absorption edge of a material because, first of all, the absorption coefficients are very high, unless you use a very, very thin specimen. And in the case of silica, which is a very wide band gap material, this fundamental absorption edge falls a very short wavelength. So it's not easy to address directly this kind of problem by a normal spectrophotometric measurements. So we'll discuss later how it's possible to attack this question. But for now, let us begin with this scheme where a photon is absorbed across the band gap and let us try to reconstruct the chain of events that is triggered by this. So once a photon is absorbed, normally an electron hole pair is generated, but this electron hole form a bound state, which everybody knows as an exciton, uh, kept together by electrostatic attraction. And one nice thing about excitons is that they can migrate from side to side because, in principle, every side is equally good to form this excitation. So a question here is how mobile are excitons in any material, but we are talking about SiO2. And how does disorder affect their mobility? Because one may expect that the fact that you have a disordered system, if you consider the amorphous form of the material, will tend to localize somehow, limit the mobility of this exciton. So this is something we'll be discussing later. And then, <clears throat> after some movement, the excitons will uh, eventually recombine, and they can do that radiatively with the exciton luminescence or non radiatively, in which case, for instance, you may have the generation of point defects. So the other question here is what are the possible outcomes of this recombination? Of course, things change if the solid is not ideal and you have defects, because this is a defect conference. Everybody knows that defects introduce some mid-cap states, which uh, give rise to new optical properties, because you will have absorption and luminescence between these states. So from a practical point of view, if you want to use the material as a material for optical applications, of course, you need to be aware about the optical properties of the most common defects, if there is an effect of disorder on this, and how defects are generated. About defects in amorphous SiO2, this is a very wide field in the literature, and as a group we have been involved in this, as I'll show you later. Um, in general, as you know, defects in a material can be introduced in many ways. Impurities are associated to defects, but even in the uh, chemically pure material, you can have intrinsic defects generated by exposure to radiation, typically. Either ionizing radiation or laser radiation. In the case of silica, it's particularly important to discuss defects generated by laser radiation because there are many applications in which the material is used, for instance, uh, in, uh, in a laser system. I have my own laser system at home, and I use silica components, so of course, one has to ask if the laser itself will damage the material and introduce defects in it. And um, 
the most common defects that can uh, be found in SiO2, in amorphous SiO2, are these two guys here. These are called the silicon dangling bond and the oxygen dangling bond. So the silicon dangling bond is a defect in which a silicon atom, instead of, being, uh, of forming four bonds with oxygen atoms, forms only three. So you are left with one dangling bond. If the same thing occurs on oxygen, you have an oxygen dangling bond. Now, for historical reasons, these are usually called the E prime center and the non bridging oxygen hole center. But anyway, they are just the silicon and oxygen dangling bond. These are by far the most common defects that you can find in uh, amorphous silica. And they give rise to very intense absorption bands in the ultraviolet in a region where the material in itself would be transparent at 4.8 EV and 5.8 EV, respectively. So if you have these defects, they usually dominate completely the UV absorption of uh, silica samples. So in irradiated silica samples, if defects get formed, you have a huge change in the UV absorption properties from transparency to uh, intense absorption due to these transitions. And another thing which is useful to know is that uh, uh, crystalline SiO2 is less prone to the formation of defects or by reverse, amorphous SiO2 is endowed with a structure of flexibility that makes it particularly uh, prone to defect formation. So these two defects are easier to form in uh, silica than they are in quartz. Okay, now uh, despite the fact that usually defects are um, uh, looked at as a liability of the material in the sense that they degrade the optical transparency, there are cases in which defects can be exploited uh, for a good aim. For instance, there are many works which show that you can use uh, controlled generation of defects in SiO2 to change locally the refractive index. So people have been building uh, optical guides inscribed in SiO2 by control changes of the refractive index or optical memories and things like this. So the facts can be either a problem or can be exploited for good reasons. In both cases, it's useful and important to know how they are generated and uh, what are the processes that we need to control if we want to control their concentration in a certain situation. And when we discuss the facts in SiO2, there is another ingredient which is uh, quite interesting which is hydrogen. So hydrogen is everywhere, is an impurity which is present in any material. And in the case of SiO2, but not only SiO2, it can either be in a bound form, so you can find hydrogen in SiO2 in SiOH or SiH groups, but it can also be found in free form. So in a given SiO2 sample, you will usually have a certain amount of H atoms or H2 molecules. And these can diffuse in SiO2. The diffusion constant of H2 in uh, silica is rather large. So at room temperature, you have diffusion and diffusion-related effects. And uh, going back to point effects, this is important because this uh, diffusing hydrogen can react with point effects and change them. For instance, as we will see later, hydrogen can react with the silicon dangling bond and convert it to SiH groups, which means you are passivating the E prime center, the silicon dangling bond, and you remove the optical absorption in the ultraviolet that the center is responsible of. So this is important from a practical point of view. And also from a fundamental point of view, once again, it's interesting to understand at the fundamental level the diffusion reaction dynamics between hydrogen and the defects and if there is a uh, role of uh, disorder in all this. Okay, as a last point for my introduction, I mentioned before that people in recent times have been uh, shifting a little bit from the study of bulk silica to nanometrically confined silica which can be a certain variety of things from nanoparticles made of silica to what people call mesoporous silica, which is a, a three-dimensional structure with pores which have uh, sizes in the nanometric domain. And uh, of course you know that there are several reasons why uh, 
a nanometric system can uh, uh, present properties which are not found in the bulk counterpart, at least two of these mechanisms need to be mentioned here. One is so-called quantum confinement, which is a process by which when you go to smaller and smaller solids, you have a, a progressive enlargement of the band gap because of a particle in a box kind of effect. This is not expected to be very important in silica because silica has already a very wide band gap when it's in the bulk form. But there is a, at least another effect which is very important. Once you get to smaller and smaller objects, the role of the surface becomes more and more important because the fraction of atoms which are at the surface is larger for a smaller object. So you will have electronic states which are associated to the surface, so-called surface mid gap states because they can fall in the mid gap region and this can completely dominate the optical properties of the material. So in some cases, it's possible that the fundamental transition from band to band becomes irrelevant in uh, as far as optical properties are concerned because these states dominate the behavior of the system. So for these reasons, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's usually, um, when, you, when you want to study a nanometrically confined system, you have uh, in your hands uh, different problems if compared to the bulk system and not necessarily what you have learned on the box system can be applied to the nanometric system, not directly. In the case of silica, we'll see later that uh, nanometrically confined silica has some new and interesting properties that people have been interested in. Okay, so let us go now to see some uh, uh, experiments that we've been doing throughout the years. So uh, I will first show you some of our investigations concerning the fundamental optical absorption properties of SiO2. By fundamental, I mean those related to the band-to-band -band transition somehow. Okay, so as I said, it's not so easy to directly address this problem by, um, let's say, a spectrophotometer because what you want to look at is an absorption which falls a very short wavelength and it's very, very large. So another way which is quite known to study this problem is to do reflectance measurements. This can be uh, conveniently carried out for silicon dioxide uh, by using synchrotron radiation because it's very broadband and extends to the extreme UV. So here we did a series of experiments where we measured essentially the reflectivity coefficient in near normal geometry uh, by using uh, uh, synchrotron radiation at the Dory storage ring from let's say five electron volts to a few tens of electron volts in order to cover a very wide spectral range, okay? So this is the typical uh, set of experimental data that you can obtain with this uh, study. You can see on the left the reflectance of a sample of amorphous SiO2 which is red and crystalline SiO2 which is blue in a range from zero to about 20 electron volts. And uh, uh, red measurements for amorphous SiO2 were taken at different temperatures. And you see that um, essentially you have a strong increase of the reflectance uh, around uh, nine to 10 electron volts, which uh, tells you that you are going beyond the band edge of the material but it's not so easy to directly interpret the reflectance spectra. Now, the nice thing about reflectance is that it can be connected to absorption by what people know as the kramer skronik relationship. kramer skronik relationship are mathematical relationship between the reflectance and the absorption, basically, or if you want, between the real and imaginary part of the refractive index, so it's possible from the, refractive, uh, from the reflectance measurements, provided that you have data on a sufficiently wide range, it is possible to calculate the absorption coefficient. So this data can be used to calculate the absorption spectra, sorry. And uh, from the raw data in reflectance mode, we can extract the absorption coefficient as a function of energy, which is exactly the same thing that theoretically you would obtain by measuring directly the absorption coefficient. Except you can't, because here the absorption coefficient of the sample is about 0.0001. 
10 to the 6 centimeters to the minus 1. So this is not something you can really measure directly. OK. Now, the absorption spectrum of uh, amorphous silica looks like this. Again, you have a strong increase around uh, 9 to 10 electron volts, which tells you that you are going beyond the fundamental edge. And then you have a series of peaks. Now, let us focus our attention on the first peak around 10 electron volts, which is this one. And you have a zoom of this peak on the right panel. This peak is uh, slightly different from when you go from the crystalline blue to the amorphous uh, uh, version of SiO2, but it's present in both. And this was already known before our studies, of course. This is uh, due to the formation of an exciton. In other words, this is the first excitonic peak of SiO2. And it peaks more or less at 10.4 EV. Now, what we did in this study is to collect very high quality data as a function of temperature, which allowed to reveal something interesting about the shape of this peak. You can see it here. Essentially, the result is very simple. This peak, both in amorphous and crystalline SiO2, has a very, very accurate Laurentian bent shape. You can see here the experimental data fitted by Laurentian curves. Also, a zoom of the fit in a semi logarithmic scale in the inset, which uh, is um, useful to know that Laurentian bent shape is accurately preserved also in the wings. So, by this work, we proved that the shape of the first absorption peak, the excitonic peak in SiO2, both in the amorphous and crystalline uh, version, is closely Laurentian, something which had not been known since then essentially because the data that people had collected before were not of sufficient quality to analyze accurately the shape of the peak. Now, what does this mean? Why this is important? The fact is that theory predicts that uh, Laurentian shape is associated to a certain property of the exciton, which is mobility. In particular, as I said in the introduction, one nice thing about excitons is that in principle, they are mobile because any site of the lattice is equally good to host an exciton. Now, the mobility of an exciton can be uh, measured, qualitatively speaking, by the time needed for an exciton to move from one site to the nearest neighbor site. Okay? Or, in other words, the fact that the exciton are mobile, from a theoretical point of view, can be associated to the fact that actually you have a band of excitonic states classified as a function of their wave vector k, because they can move. And it can be shown that the width of this band, which is called b in this slide, is nothing else than the inverse of the time needed for an exciton to jump from side to side. So, we can characterize exciton mobility with this parameter b. The larger b is, the larger the exciton band is, and the shorter is the time needed for the exciton to jump from side to side. So the more mobile the exciton is. Now, in a real system, you will always have some fluctuations from side to side of the energy of the, of the excitonic state. These arise from thermal disorder, if you have a crystalline system, but if you have an amorphous system, they arise also from structural disorder. So in principle, in an amorphous system, not all sides are precisely equal. So you have necessarily some fluctuations from side to side of this energy. Now, theory predicts that the behavior of the exciton is completely different depending on the relation existing from, uh, between B and D. So mobility and fluctuations. There are two extreme cases. If B is much larger than D, meaning that the fluctuations are small or the mobility is very high, then the, 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 the fluctuations do not hinder the mobility, the in, inherent mobility of the exciton, and the exciton uh, remains very mobile and delocalized, meaning that the excitonic states are delocalized and the exciton is fully mobile. Otherwise, if D is much larger than D, the inverse situation, it means that this order is so high to completely cancel the mobility of the exciton. The exciton becomes localized, no longer capable of moving from side to side. So this is uh, 
I mean, the results of uh, excitonic theory by this guy named Toyozawa, who recently uh, re retired, I, I believe. Uh, so uh, the interesting fact is that uh, the theory predicts that uh, uh, exciton, which are mobile, are associated to Laurentian absorption line shapes. Otherwise, if mobility is hindered by disorder, you have Gaussian line shapes. So the fact that we found very closely uh, preserved uh, Laurentian line shapes means simply that the excitons in both crystalline SiO2 and amorphous SiO2 are very mobile. So disorder, both thermal disorder, but also structural disorder in the amorphous uh, version of the material are not strong enough to hinder the mobility of the exciton. Now this is interesting because if you think of it, uh, an amorphous system like silica may be expected not to be capable of supporting uh, exciton mobility because of disorder. The first thing you, you would think to be lost in a disorder system is the ability to transport energy or charge or whatever needs to be transferred because of disorder. Well, this work proved that this is not the case for excitons. So excitons in uh, amorphous silica are closely crystalline-like and capable of strong mobility. Okay, which contrasts with the previous uh, understanding of excitons in SiO2. Okay, once we know something about the mobility of the excitons, the next step is to know what happens to them after they move. And the one way of investigating this is to see, for instance, if there is any photoluminescence uh, emitted by the sample when you excite the excitonic peak at 10.4 eV, which is what we did in this experiment. So here you can see the luminescence spectrum of crystalline and amorphous SiO2 as detected when exciting both at 10.4 eV, meaning in the first excitonic peak. There is this band at around uh, 2.7 eV, sorry, which is present in both, except it's uh, more intense in crystalline SiO2 and less intense in amorphous SiO2, but except for this, it's present in both samples. Then in amorphous SiO2, you have an additional band around 1.9 eV. Now forget for a moment the additional band at 1.9. Let us focus for a moment on this. Uh, this band is something that was already known before our studies, and it's basically uh, the band of the self-trapped exciton in SiO2. You can recognize this because first of all, this band is uh, observed in any kind of SiO2, it's ubiquitous, it can be observed not only under light illumination above edge, but also under X-ray exposure, for instance. So it's observed everywhere, it's not associated to any kind of defect of impurity, it's inherent to the system. And it has a very uh, huge stoke shift because excitation at 10.4 gives rise to emission at 2.7. So this is, cannot be, of course, the emission from the free exciton, some uh, huge degree of structural relaxation need to be involved to explain such a large stoke shift. So this is due to the self-trapped exciton in SiO2. So the photogenerated excitons in part give rise to, uh, in, in part get trapped at some point and give rise to the self-trapped exciton emission. However, the interesting fact is that in amorphous SiO2, apart from this emission, you also have this peak at 1.9 eV. Now the peak at 1.9 eV is known to be the characteristic photoluminescence of oxygen dangling bonds. So these results tell that excitons, after they are generated, can uh, eventually uh, end up by doing two things. They either get trapped form self-trapped excitons which are capable of emitting photoluminescence here, or excitons can actually decay non-radiatively in another way that leads to the formation of point defects. So this is a direct evidence of the process by which excitons form point defects in SiO2. It's worth noting that this happens only in amorphous SiO2. As I told you at the beginning, Amorphous SiO2 is much more prone to the formation of defects. In fact, this doesn't happen at all in crystalline SiO2. Okay, 
Okay, so to summarize uh, this part of the talk, essentially we did a certain number of studies aimed at investigating the fundamental optical properties of CO2, and the main results of this were to clarify the nature of the excitons in amorphous uh, SiO2, which surprisingly are very crystalline-like, in the sense that they preserve their mobility despite structural disorder in the system. Apart from this, we also found that excitons can migrate, but also after a certain uh, uh, time, which would need further studies to be determined. This is one of the open questions, if you want, of the studies. But after a certain time from the initial generation, they can either get trapped somewhere and become self-trapped excitons, but they can also give rise to different outcomes. One of these is the generation of point defects, as evidenced by their luminescent signals. OK, let's now jump to a different topic which is the photo-induced generation of point effects in SiO2. As I said in the introduction, this is very important uh, for practical reasons, and especially if you think of generation induced by laser radiation. So we did a certain number of experiments to address this. Now, there was uh, a lot of um, interest uh, in the second half of the 90s and the first half of the 2000s about this problem, and there were a lot of very interesting studies which uh, explained a lot of things, but when we began to study this, we, uh, we noticed that there was something missing in the studies. In fact, most of the studies used what I would describe as an ex situ method to study these processes. By ex situ method, I mean you take the sample, you irradiate the sample, you wait some time and then you use several spectroscopies to see what the effect of irradiation has been on the sample. This, of course, is very informative, but there is the possibility that when you do this, you are missing something because you don't monitor the kinetics of all this. So to do something uh, new and trying to contribute to the understanding of the processes, we set up a system, actually a very simple one, to study in situ these processes. So the goal of these experiments was to study the entire kinetics that takes place in the sample while you are irradiating the sample with laser radiation. In this setup, the sample which is here is being exposed to high power ultraviolet radiation which is capable of generating point effects. And then during this uh, irradiation, we monitor continuously the absorption spectrum of the sample by an optical fiber spectrophotometer. And these measurements continue even after the laser is turned off, because as I will show you, there are kinetics that occur immediately after the, the end of the irradiation that you would have missed completely by an ex situ approach, okay? So this is an example of a result that you can get with this experiment. This is a silica sample which is being irradiated with uh, uh, UV laser pulses, 4.7 EV photon energy. And uh, in the course of time during the radiation, we see this is a differential absorption spectrum measured at several delays during the radiation. We see the progressive growth of a band, of an absorption band at 5.8 electron volts. When we turn off the laser, we see that this band begins to decay spontaneously, okay? As seen in the lower panel. Now, this band is the known absorption band of the silicon dangling bond in SiO2. So, of course, this result means that the laser is capable of generating silicon dangling bonds in our sample. They grow and then they decay spontaneously after the end of your radiation. Since uh, the absorption cross-section of this defect was known, one can translate this data into concentration data. So eventually from this data, we get the kinetics of uh, the concentration of the defect as a function of time. As I told you before, there is this growth and then a spontaneous decay in the post-irradiation stage. Of course, if this same uh, experiment would have been done with an ex situ approach, we uh, 
would be only able to see the overall combined effect of growth and decay. So we found the, this uh, setup informative in the sense that it allowed to see the entire kinetics and we began to study this in some detail. I'll tell you some of the results we obtained by this study. First of all, why does the center decay in the post-irradiation stage? What is the process responsible of this decay? Essentially, I'll jump to the conclusion, the process is the reaction of the defect with diffusing hydrogen present in the sample. There are several uh, ways to, to become convinced of this, to prove this. One of them is the temperature dependence. There is no post-irradiation decay if the experiment is done below about 200 uh, Kelvin. This process, uh, this decay is only observed at higher temperatures, higher than 200 Kelvin, and 200 Kelvin is known as uh, the activation temperature of uh, hydrogen diffusion in SiO2. So this is a way of seeing that actually this must be due to a diffusion control reaction. And by this, we were able also to study, to extract from this uh, kinetics the reaction constant between the silicon dangling bond and uh, hydrogen, because this is contained, of course, in this kinetics. And we found some uh, uh, quantitative parameters which describe the reaction constant between uh, the defect and hydrogen which are of some applicative interest because of course uh, hydrogen can be used to cancel the silicon dangling bonds which means to recover transparency in the material because these uh, defects are responsible of strong UV absorption and this characterizes their reaction with hydrogen in a quantitative way. One uh, interesting thing that we found that the activation energy of this reaction is statistically distributed. You cannot reproduce the kinetics unless you assume that there is some statistical distribution of the energy required for the reaction. And this is a manifestation of the disordered nature of the system, which gives rise to fluctuation from center to center of the activation energy needed for the reaction with hydrogen. Okay, now uh, once this, is, uh, this was clarified, the next question is, uh, what is the generation mechanism of the defect? And also, where does the hydrogen come from? I mean, we have uh, silicon dangling bonds generated by laser. We also have hydrogen responsible of their passivation. So the question is, where does the hydrogen come from and how the defects get generated by laser light? Now, we studied this and the answer we proposed is that actually uh, both of them are generated by a single process. So the main uh, uh, event taking place in the sample uh, uh, upon UV irradiation is this one. You have uh, pre-existing SIH bonds in the sample as impurities and they get photochemically broken by laser light generating at the same time silicon dangling bonds and hydrogen. And then what we observe in the post-irradiation stage is due essentially to the geminate recombination of the two. There are ways to see this. One uh, way to be convinced of this is the following. If you study the decay rate of uh, the uh, silicon dangling bonds as a function, for instance, of uh, laser intensity, so these are kinetics obtained at different laser intensities. Defect always get generated, but they get to different concentration and then they decay with different rates. So from this initial decay rate extracted from this part of the kinetics, it's possible to indirectly estimate the concentration of hydrogen responsible of the decay by doing some math. And then we showed that the concentration of hydrogen is linearly correlated to the concentration of E prime, which means that they need to come from a single process if their concentration always correlated to each other. So the picture that comes from these uh, uh, studies is the following. You have these impurities, you break photochemically SIH bonds, you generate silicon dangling bonds and hydrogen atoms, 
then hydrogen atoms are very unstable at room temperature in uh, silicon dioxide. They easily react with other atoms to form molecules, H2. And then what we observe in the post-radiation stage, this decay is due to the recombination of E prime centers with hydrogen. Okay. Then we examined another aspect of this kinetics. Let us look again of the, uh, to the kinetics obtained at different laser intensities. If we now concentrate our attention here on the first uh, steps of the generation, we can extract a generation rate for the defects. So the efficiency by which the laser generates the defect is related to the slope, the initial slope of these curves. And if you plot this as a function of laser intensity, what you see is that uh, the dependence is not linear. Precisely, the defect generation rate depends, uh, is linearly correlated to the square of laser intensity. There is a quadratic dependence, as you can see in this plot. Now, this means, essentially, that two photons are used, two photons from the laser field are used to generate the defects by photochemical breaking of SIH bonds. Now, the fact that two photons are needed is not uh, surprising because if the band gap of silica is about 10 eV and uh, we are using a laser whose photon energy is uh, 5 eV, more or less, of course you need two photons to overcome the band gap. However, there are in general two possible uh, um, scenarios which are consistent with this kind of result. One is so-called two-photon absorption, which is the coherent and simultaneous absorption of two photons from the electromagnetic field, and doesn't need a state in between. You only need what a theoretician would call a virtual state. The other possibility is a so-called two-step absorption, which is the consecutive absorption of two photons. First, absorption brings you to a real state, which has a certain lifetime, and during this lifetime, you absorb a second photon, and from there, you jump to the conduction band. Now, this is much more efficient than this. So two-step absorption, if you have a real state in between, then you are, are in the possibility of, of observing this, and two-step absorption is much more efficient than two-photon absorption. Now, we wanted to understand which of the two is involved in our case. First of all, if you do some math, you can demonstrate easily that at the laser intensity we were using, two-photon absorption is quite unlikely. So this uh, brings you to the suspect that two-step absorption must be involved. But anyway, another way of investigating this is to study this process as a function of laser wavelength. Because if there is a real state in between, it means that probably you need to see a resonance where you hit the real state, okay? So we did this experiment. Essentially, we measured the generation rate of the defects as a function of laser wavelength or photon energy, which is the same thing. And as you can see in this plot, we actually observed a peak in the generation rate at about 5.1 electron volts. Now, if you look at the absorption spectrum of the sample, the sample has a peak at around 5.1 electron volts, which is known to be due to germanium impurities. And also we found that actually the generation rate of the defects is linearly correlated to concentration of these impurities. So overall, this proved that germanium impurities present in the sample provide a way to enhance the generation rate of point defects in the sense that they introduce a mid-gap states around 5.1 eV and then when you use a laser around 5 eV you can use this state to jump much more efficiently to the conduction band so to produce electron hole pair with a very very large efficiency and this ultimately results in the generation of a lot of defects. So the message here is even very small concentration because here we are talking about uh, part per million of germanium impurities. So even very small concentrations of impurities, if they provide a level where you are not supposed to have a level, uh, can uh, lead to a material which is very easy to damage by laser radiation. Okay, so 
to summarize, these studies allow to clarify what we believe to be at least one important mechanism of damage of SiO2 under laser radiation that proceeds by photochemical uh, cleavage of SiH uh, bonds already present in the sample and forms uh, defects. Interesting aspects of this that were revealed by the studies that the concentration of the facts is limited by the fact that after irradiation you have recombination of the defects with hydrogen made available by the same process. So this in some way protects the sample from uh, the growth of defects. Okay, now I'll go to the last part of the talk which will be quite quick and concerns some uh, recent uh, uh, studies in, in the group uh, that concern nanometrically confined silicas. Now, why is nanometrically confined silica important? There are many answers to this question, but I'll give you one. Based on what I've been telling you up to now, you should be convinced that uh, silica is uh, a material which is nice for many aspects, but uh, is not a good emitter. Because if you resort to intrinsic emission, then you need to excite silica uh, across the band gap, so with very, very short wavelength radiation, and the emission you get is the emission from self-trapped excitons, which, by the way, has a quantum yield of about 10 to the minus 3, so it's not very intense. If you want to use point defects to get emission, well, the silicon dangling bond does not give you any luminescence, and the other common defect, the oxygen dangling bond, gives a red emission, 1.9 eV, which is relatively weak. So the most common defects, as well as the inherent properties of the system, do not make silica a good emitter. Of course, this can be solved by doping. You can introduce everything that emits in your material. But another way to overcome this problem is to go to the nanometric scale. Because many studies have seen that silica nanoparticles, here you don't see it very well, I guess, but there is a transmission electron microscopy image of a nanoparticle of silica about 10 nanometer sized. It's hard to see because it's amorphous, but it's there. If you get closer, you will see. Uh, silica nanoparticles, uh, many studies have seen that are very bright emitters. So if you have a nanoparticle of silica, typically below 50 nanometers, this gives rise to very strong uh, photoluminescence emission. So going to the nanoscale makes silica a interestingly uh, good emitters, which is nice for applications because silica is also considered normally a non-toxic material. So imagine of applications where this can be exploited for uh, bioimaging or for drug delivery in living tissues because it's luminescent. You can monitor the position of these objects by luminescence, but it's also non-toxic and things like this. So people have been uh, studying this, including our group, and there are right now a lot of questions about uh, the origin of this emission. Here you can see some studies on uh, this photoluminescence. Essentially, when you excite uh, over a very wide range, the sample, you get a luminescence which has its maximum around 2.7 electron volts, but the nice thing is that it shifts quite a bit depending on where it is excited, which means that it's, to a certain degree, it's tunable. Depending on where you excite it, you get slightly different shapes and peak energy of the emission. Uh, this tunability, apart from being interesting from an applicative point of view, but it's also the sign of a dramatic uh, inhomogeneous effect. It's something that is usually not found in bulk silica. So it means that uh, um, the photoluminescence from uh, silica nanoparticles uh, has properties which are different from those that you normally know in bulk SiO2, and this very signal in itself is not found, which is usually called the blue luminescence of silica nanoparticles, not found with the same spectroscopical characteristic in bulk SiO2. Uh, 
some uh, general findings about this blue uh, emission is that, for one, this is found more or less everywhere in silica nanoparticles. Here you can see the blue emission as we detected in uh, nanoparticles produced by laser ablation and liquid phase. Here you can see the same emission uh, as measured in commercial uh, uh, silica nanoparticles. So essentially, uh, independently of the way the, the particles are prepared, this luminescence is usually observed. And however, this is, uh, tends to grow with the inverse of the size of the nanoparticles. Here you can see the area of this emission as a function of the specific surface of the nanoparticles. So the smaller the nanoparticles are, the larger their specific surface, the more intense the luminescence is, okay? And also, the, this emission is quite sensitive to environmental interaction, meaning that, for instance, in solution, it's sensitive to pH, or it's sensitive to the atmosphere where the nanoparticles are in, and so on. So these results, together with the environmental interactions, makes people think that uh, the blue PL comes from surface states, as I anticipated during the introduction. Of course, the fact that you confine the system to a nanometric scale means that surface-related electronic states become very important in determining the optical properties. However, it's still an open problem to understand which specific surface moieties are associated to the electronic states that give rise to this emission. The most common interpretation, which uh, is uh, currently uh, referred to in the literature, is due to <coughs> Uccino group and uh, attributes this defect uh, attributes this luminescence to these defects present on the surface, but this is actually an open problem. Uh, and uh, the properties of uh, silicon nanoparticles are not so simple, in the sense that uh, not only they give rise to this ubiquitous blue emission, which is uh, very intense and uh, interesting for the reason I said, but there are also additional emissions which are all different from what you observe in the bulk. For instance, some recent work from our group showed that uh, when you expose nanoparticles to a vacuum, meaning you just put them in a cryostat and remove all air, you immediately see the appearance of a, a, another luminescent signal which is distinct from the blue luminescence, which is peculiar of these nanoparticles not found in bulk, and you can see here, it's, a, as you can see, a luminescent signal which is structured. It has a certain number of peaks which are indicative of uh, uh, coupling of the electronic transition to phonon modes at some specific frequencies. <clears throat> right now we have no idea of what is the chemical structure responsible for this luminescence, but this is another signal which, for one, is not present in bulk silica. So it's peculiar to the nanoparticles, and also it has uh, completely different properties as compared to the blue band, because the fact that you can observe so easily this vibronic structure means that you have a very low inhomogeneous width, because otherwise this structure will be wiped out. So this must be some kind of defect on the surface, which is more or less disentangled by the bulk, the, the core of the nanoparticle. Okay. So, um, to summarize what I just said, uh, silica becomes a very efficient emitter when reduced to the nanometric scale. However, the properties of this emission, which very likely comes from surface states, are completely different from those that are known in bulk. So this opens a new uh, uh, world for people who have been studying silica for years because the properties of this uh, signals are not known and it will need very likely a lot of time to be studied. Which means there is still a very much work to be done on the systems. And one thing I like to remark to conclude my talk is that uh, despite the apparent simplicity of a material like SiO2, when people have been uh, uh, trying to understand the, uh, the properties of the material on a fundamental uh, level, 
they found that uh, they hide a rather surprising level of complexity, which uh, may be quite, uh, was actually quite unexpected by the first people who began to study. And uh, the fact that now we are uh, shifting our attention, we and many other people in the world, to nanosilica makes the, the story even more fascinating because uh, nanosilica apparently cannot be easily understood on the grounds of what we have learned on bulk silica. Okay. Of course, this happens not only for SiO2, but for many other materials, which is uh, the beautiful thing about uh, material science, if you want. Okay, so let me conclude by thanking again the organizers of the conference. Of course, this is a very old picture of uh, our group. This guy is me when I was maybe five kilograms more than I am now, and many years younger. <laughs> so forget about it. It's just to, to say that uh, the work I presented is not my work. Many, many people have uh, been involved in this. And uh, so I'd like to thank all the group and you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for, for the very interesting presentation. It's now open for discussion and question. Yes. I want to ask about uh, generation of point defects as you mentioned. Yes. In my opinion, you don't deal with generation of defects. You deal with transformation of pre-existing as grown defects because to produce intrinsic defects, you should to have excitation in the fundamental absorption region. As I understood, in your regime of excitation by laser, you don't uh, realize two photon regimes. There are several works done when efficiency of excitation is significantly high and in two photon regime you can produce defects or in other case you can use one photon mode having 10 EV VUV photon and then you can have results are they the same as you shown us now here or not it depends from experiment because this idea of some additional level connected with Germany, uh, ge ge yes, Germanium, yes, probably. Germania, yeah. yes. Ge Germania, not, ge <laughs> German, not yeah. generally with Germany, but with element connected with Germany, Germanium. Uh, I'm not sure that it works in such a way. Thank well, you. Um, about the fact that we are not generating, but we are transforming, I totally agree. In fact, what we are proposing is to, that the defects are generated by breakage of pre-existing uh, precursors. So yes, I agree with this. Of course, I believe in <laughs> the result that shows that uh, an intermediate state is involved. I don't know why you don't, <laughs> we can discuss it later. But I mean, it, simply, the, the generation rate of the defects is linearly correlated with the presence of this uh, um, defect while it's uh, quadratically correlated with the intensity. So in my opinion, this proves clearly that you have a two photon absorption mediated by a mid gap state. Of course, this is an interpretation. Anyway, as of, for the first part of your comment, yes, I agree. In fact, we need the uh, pre-existing defects. Also, we need the catalyzer, which is a germanium impurity. So yes, more to the point. OK, next question. Please. Thank you very much for your very interesting, really, um, presentation. I have a small question about um, the band gap, because you demonstrated very well from optical measurements that the band gap of silica <coughs> is uh, very high, located to about uh, 11 EV. Uh, what about electrical measurements? I mean, uh, if one makes uh, photoconductivity measurements, for example, to evaluate the band gap, do you expect the same value or different ones? I, I, I remember that in the literature there are some works that predict a lower value of the wind gap, but they are related to electrical measurements. So I would like to comment on that. Yes, uh, so there, was, there were some um, photoconductivity measurements that uh, many years ago uh, 
apparently uh, showed some photoconductivity starting from about 9 eV. So people were convinced that the band gap uh, was lower. However, later works <coughs> showed that actually there was a problem in these initial uh, experiments. And the most, um, we, we didn't do it ourselves, but there are some works in the literature that show that actually the, big, the, the onset of real photoconductivity is around 11 electron volts. So it's consistent with our results. Okay. One, one last question. In fact, I have two questions and one comment. For the mobility of exciton uh, you show in amorphous silicon, do you think it is unique for silicon or other amorphous like aluminum oxide? We can also, you can also see this. The other question, of course, you're talking about the amorphous with a big grain size. When we talk about the nanoparticle amorphous silicon, I believe probably the grain size is going to affect right, this phenomena. What do you think about this? So this took my, 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 my last comment actually was expected for hydrogen and amorphous silicon because this is very important, especially for microelectronics because we, we really induce hydrogen and silica. You know, there is a large cluster of defects are formed mm -hmm. by the induce of hydrogen. So you probably wanna, when you talk about defective silica, you really wanna have to mention about this because it's, it has been measured with positron inhalation, I think. It's the best I want. Okay, so thanks for the comment. As for the questions, first question was uh, if I expect this behavior to be common to other amorphous material. When we did this work, we compared this with the literature results on other amorphous materials. There is not so much, but for instance, <clears throat> uh, this behavior of silicon dioxide is completely different from uh, silicon. Because in silicon, if you look at the excitonic peak in the crystalline and amorphous version of the material, they are completely different. The amorphous peak is very, very much broader than with a Gaussian shape in the amorphous version. So in that case, the structural disorder changes completely the property of the exciton. So I, I don't expect this to be a very... Uh, yeah, yeah, but silicon is very, is very at a narrow band again. <coughs> Yes, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I need to check this. But uh, I believe that this could happen in... Uh, I'm not sure it depends on how wide the band gap is. I believe it depends on how disordered the system is. So, of course, having a large band gap could help in the sense that if the band gap is large, then also the width of the excitonic band, B, uh, will tend to be large. So, yes, in principle, this may... May, may be a way of reducing the impact of uh, fluctuations because fluctuations in energy will always be of a certain size, say below one electron volt. So yes, maybe it would be, but, but this, uh, I mean, would be a good uh, uh, topic for further investigations actually.